part two of the Kurungberg Pass deals with the second half of the ascent. If you intend driving this pass, it's important to watch part one first, which contains the Google Earth orientation clips, as well as other important information on history, safety and tourism. If you ever wondered about those circles that can be seen all over the Kurungberg, they're caused by termite mounds. They are common to most Rhinosterfeld zones and the Tigerberg in Cape Town was so named as from a distance it looked like the spots of a leopard which the Dutch in the 1600s and 1700s called tigers, hence Tigerberg. The tiny village of Kurungberg lies at the northern edge of the mountain of the same name. Founded at Warren's Camp, which was a railway station named after the constructor in 1923, it was thus named because it was situated in a wheat growing area. The name is Afrikaans and means literally Wheat Mountain. The mountain known as Kurungberg lies along the northwest southeast axis and is actually one long mountain but has two official names. The more northerly segment is Kurungberg and the southerly section is called Swartberg but no one uses this name locally despite the farm at the southern end bearing the name Swartberg. The first farm to be registered in the area was Hoogelegen, which later morphed from Dutch to Afrikaans as Hoogelea. The farm was first registered to a Mr. Beste in 1709 and was sold to a Mr. Lombard in 1841 for the equivalent of three rand. In 1843, Beste repurchased the farm, which has only changed owners three times. To Beste Jr. in 1880, Van Aarde in 1907 and Mostert in 1990. The Kurungberg comprises three farms, Hoogelegen, Vleedam and Brockwater, with the latter farm being the only one with perennial water for livestock. In the early farming days, the three farm owners had a system of watering their livestock in shifts, with each being allocated a specific time of day for the purpose. The fountain which was known as Otschamoa and collapsed in the 1969 Tilbach earthquake. The three farms were originally all part of Wuchelechen, which was later subdivided into the three. After negotiating a small side ravine, another intersection appears ahead. This is the shorter route mentioned earlier, which now rejoins the main route at the 4 km point. From 1900, when the railway line was constructed, the village of Kurungberg began growing as businessmen moved into the village, seeing the financial opportunities in wheat production, storage, transportation and sales. A water trough was built along the main street to water the animals, whilst the blacksmith and wagon maker set up shop to cater for the needs of the transport riders. All the original houses were built using a local clay-like stone, which was plastered with a mud mixture. The road continues climbing relentlessly after the intersection, swinging through a wide right-hand curve and at the 4.4 km mark, the first true hairpin bend is reached. This turn has a very tight arc and bigger SUVs and buckies will need to go into full lock to clear it. In addition, it's also very steep. If you have a diff lock, use it here. The exact boundaries of the Swartland differ depending on the map used, but the Swartland municipality extends from the boundary of the city of Cape Town at the northern end of Durbanville, northwards to Picketburg, and from Azerfontein in the west to the Berg River near Ribeck Castile and Ribeck West in the east. At the heart of the region lies its largest town, Malmesbury, originally known as Swartland's Kerk. Due to its relatively flat topography, fertile soils and close proximity to Cape Town, the Swartland became established as a wheat growing area around about the mid-1700s. In the late 1800s, when gold and diamonds were discovered upcountry, farming in the region expanded significantly. In the 1930s, when it was cheaper to import wheat than produce it locally, wheat farmers were subsidized by the government and it became profitable to farm even on marginal lands with poorer soils and steep slopes. It was during this period that the Swartland became an almost uninterrupted agricultural zone. Once you've turned sharp left at the saddle, the road begins climbing once more towards the next set of towers dead ahead. The smaller set of masts occurs at a false summit, after which the road dips downhill for a short while before the true summit is ascended. This climb is best tackled in low range for better control. Be sure to watch part 3 of the Kurungberg Pass, which deals with the summit area as well as the first part of the southern descent.